Welcome all. Uh, it's great to have you all on board here on this nice summer evening. Uh, today, I'm you know really excited to be here um, to on this Zoom call because I think we've got three awesome uh, speakers tonight, and who are really at the top of the game, and who I I know well, know all of them well, and um, they're great speakers, and we've got a really entertaining lineup for you. So. Kicking off the evening, we've got um, uh, Dr. Dean Halfpenny, who's a pain consultant, uh, who is excellent with any long-term pain, any difficult sorts of pain. And he's gonna be chatting about myofascial um, pain around the neck and shoulder girdle region. We've then got Lorenzo, a consultant in sports and exercise medicine, who is really again top of his game knows he's everything there is to know about tendon pathology and you know working across sports and 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 the exercise population and he's going to be talking about tennis elbow which is always an interesting one to treat and then of course we've got simon owen johnson who, who's an upper limb uh, specialist uh, who has seen a lot of different shoulder upper limb cases and he's speaking more about COVID and how we're practicing now and what it's doing to uh, yeah some of the rules and guidelines within medicine so yeah without further ado I'd like to open it to Dean we're, we're also gonna have a Q&A section at the end so if you've got any questions to so just pop it um, in the Q&A section and we'll get to them we'll try and um, get all your questions answered answered towards the end thanks guys enjoy Thanks very much, Simon, for the introduction. Um, just um, attempting to share screen and bring up my slides. Um, it's great to be here. Um, thanks very much for joining. Um, I've got 10 minutes, and in 10 minutes, I, I, I hope to at least cover some of the principles of from myofascial neck pain and, and, and the issues, the presentation and, and the treatment options that we currently have. Rupal, who's... Uh, Technical, ah, oh, brilliant. Um, I just need to be able to get to my slides. Great. Upper limb pathologies that are focusing on neck pain. Um, I've got 10 minutes to get through this talk. I should be able to manage. Of course, there's a lot, a lot of neck pathologies out there, but if we focus primarily on, on, on the myofascial component, I think that would probably do best. Um, in terms of the typical causes, I use this as one of the slides that, that helps me uh, think about the musculoskeletal system and, and, and the pathogenesis of pain. And, and I always look at things at joints and ligaments, and of course in the neck it's discs, tendons, ligaments, and muscles. And the issue that we often have is, is you know, neck pain can be, can be quite challenging in as much as we're often looking for a structural abnormality, and we, 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 we very seldom find something that we can truly pin our hat on and say that's it. So I don't want to dwell on, on, on disc lesions or specific to or, or for that matter, things like rheumatoid arthritis or other inflammatory arthropathies. But rather, as I've only got 10 minutes, I want to talk about myofascial pain and, and, and how, how it happens and, and, and basically why muscles and soft tissue hurt. Um, I made this slide yesterday uh, because what I'm seeing, and, and Simon, you touched on this earlier, we're seeing a slightly different pathology now, and I am seeing a lot of work-related upper limb pain. And I've, I've sort of questioned what's gone on during the lockdown and, and how our lives have changed, how our activity has changed. And I guess the factors for persistent pain are, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of anxiety, which, which doesn't help. You know, if we're looking at the overall risk factors for developing persistent pain problems, anxiety, low socioeconomic status, clearly environmental, previous pain state, and the path of injury are very, very important in, 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 in sort of predicting the long-term outcome. 
Other factors which I feel have, have taken place really recently is that people are relatively inactive compared to what they were doing before, which this is, doesn't apply to everybody, but certainly if one considers general levels of fitness or, or stamina, let's assume during normal commuting weeks, one is working. So our levels of fitness are higher, which means our, our, our stamina is better. And, and, and what I feel we're seeing is that people's stamina and ability to sit still either in Zoom meetings or in poor ergonomic environments is exacerbating the problem of myofascial neck pain. Now, what's quite interesting about muscles is they can compensate to a point, and once they fatigue, that's when all hell seems to break loose. And, and this, again, is something I'm seeing. You know, quite recalcitrant, very, very stick, uh, very, very um, tender and, and stuck necks, which I haven't to date seen that much of sure work related problems have been around for a long time but if one considers that a lot of home workers were sent home at very short notice without much thought into their ergonomics without much thought into how they would stagger or, st or, or, or structure their days and so so i have had the most bizarre calls of patients who've literally got stuck during six hour meetings they've they've not moved from a sofa and, and you know all sorts of disasters do happen so i just wanted to just touch on the fact that you know times are slightly different and possibly relative inactivity and poor ergonomics are definitely contributing to the overall state i feel at this point um next slide i wanted to just refresh everybody's concept of pain because the definitions often change so in my book We've got nociceptive, inflammatory, neuropathic, and nociplastic, which has now replaced central pain system sensitization. So again, nociception simply depicts normal physiological detection of a noxious stimulus and an appropriate response. So we all have them, we all need them, except for that woman up in Scotland, Jo Clark, who's, who's got an anandamide problem and she doesn't feel pain. But the, the vast majority of us, we do feel pain appropriately. With inflammatory pain, i.e. where there is inflammation at some point, what tends to happen is, is nociception is just enhanced and increased. So if we're measuring action potentials through, through C fibers, they are massively increased in the presence of, of inflammation. So where there is inflammation and there are um, um, pain receptors, we will find that the pain is generally enhanced with more stimulus. Neuropathic pain, by pure definition, should actually uh, simply mean pain that arises within the nervous system. And that will be from axon right through to somatosensory cortex. Any lesion along the course of that will result in a neuropathic pain state. Now, I think what we tend to do often is we tend to look for one pain or the other. Is it inflammatory? Is it nociceptive? Is it this? And very often it's a combination of all of them. And I think it's important to realize that you know after a short while and i say a short while many weeks or so small elements of neuropathic pain creep in and similarly nociplastic pain which is central pain will start to activate and that that becomes what i consider to be quite challenging in terms of not only diagnosis but challenging from from a therapeutic perception um, and so nociplastic pain really replaces the old central pain sensitization that we used to talk about but essentially it is the same so you know one can assume you've got a degree of nociceps of some inflammatory and you've got nociplastic which of course uh, has has far more uh, psychological impacts on patients and their well-being um, again i just use this slide to highlight classic examples of, of primary nociceptive the overlap and then of course your primary neuropathics which of course are phn trigeminal neuralgia which are infections of the nervous system um, and then of course around surrounding that venn diagram you've got nociplastic pain let's move on to what happens at a pathological level and the way i i see the development of 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 myofascial pain is that there is as I said earlier, muscles will compensate to a point, soft tissue will compensate to a point, but as soon as you, you overload it through either microtrauma or, or repetitive use and microtrauma, you will suddenly fall off a cliff where the muscle decompensates and, and, and starts to fail. And by starting to fail, I mean tight bands, trigger points, uh, spasm, or, or simply not, not, not responding to exercise, not, 
not not actually moving and that's called pain inhibition and i'll come to that in a moment what's happening at a tissue level is that there is often uh, a degree of of inflammatory change uh, it's 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 certainly not enough to to bump up inflammatory markers so it's something that can't really be measured uh, unfortunately very very little of what i'm talking about can actually be visualized on any medical imaging um, you know, it really is a clinical diagnosis and a diagnosis of exclusion. And so, you know, when I am taking a history, of course, I'm cognizant of the fact, you know, there could be a disc problem. Clearly, root problems present slightly differently. Um, but, but, you know, I, I, I do take each patient on their merit. And, and where I've excluded structural and anatomical causes, I will often go back to my first diagnostic hunch that it's more than likely myofascial. So I will look for causality. I look for exacerbating factors. I look for treatments that have and haven't worked in the past. But in summary, there are tissue changes which take place, um, which are recognized, and, and, and these potentially generate an awful lot of pain. The other thing that does tend to happen in, in the presence of, of low-level inflammation is that excitable tissue becomes more excitable. So, so the end plate synaptic potentials of muscles, in other words, they become slightly the, to, to, to exceed the threshold for an action potential is easily reached. And then you end up with things like trigger points. In this slide, I've got three areas I want to talk about. Primarily, nociceptor activation and what's happening. Of course, we've got our typical uh, 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 factors that would, would stimulate your nociceptors, be they heat, be they potassium ions, be they mechanical. So these mechanoreceptors and these pain receptors are certainly activated in any pain state. The next slide goes, or the next um, diagram goes on to demonstrate the end excitatory postsynaptic potentials. And you will see that a normal action potential is generated when a certain threshold is reached. But where you have inflammation, where you have localized tissue damage these these end plate potentials are slightly more unstable which means that spasm is far more likely where there has been a degree of tissue damage albeit at a very low level and so the tendency to spasm the tendency to develop trigger points is much greater where there has been some degree of myofascial disturbance or overload and so essentially what i'm demonstrating is is muscles become slightly irritable uh, and they're not likely to respond, or put it this way, if they're not responding to the work that Simon would be doing, the hands-on therapy, uh, the mobility exercises, uh, and, uh, and obviously everything else to release, then it probably is important to, to introduce medication or to introduce a therapy that's likely to, to, to change uh, this, this, this non-physiological state in the muscles themselves. And finally, on the right side, I just wanted to touch on pain inhibition um, and, and of course planning any motor response occurs in the cortex, the motor cortex, there is interpretation of demands and planning but in the presence of pain all of this is disrupted quite massively uh, and even down to the final motor command at the uh, acetylcholine and muscle contractile level you can still have direct reflex pain inhibition. So, where, where myofascial pain gets really stuck in, it can be incredibly challenging to, to, to make progress because very often with gentle exercises, these patients will simply flare up. And so their, their perception of, of, of early conservative treatment is often marred by the fact that after one or two physio sessions, and this is, this is, this is no indictment of physiotherapists, but it just is a fact that they will flare up or they do flare up and very often they will need medication to reduce their flares or to manage them at the outset. Uh, and of course, I'll talk a little bit about medication in a moment. Um, this is my sort of final summary slide. And, and I want to just raise some points here that even acute pain is often multifactorial. I think it's important to take a really detailed history and, 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 and look at risk factors that patients may present with. I always try to use a multimodal approach because I believe that you know, the treating pain I, I, I not only, if, if I suspect that there's inflammation, I will use an anti-inflammatory. I, in, in acute spasm, I will certainly use drugs such as diazepam, which I find for, in the short term, can certainly get patients going again and can then help them sleep. The other drugs are, should we say, slightly more controversial. Uh, conventional painkillers, the, the, the tramadols and the opioids, 
I, I think have very little role to play in terms of pain management, uh, particularly in, in, in the myofascial setting. Um, uh, whereas drugs such as gabapentin or pregabalin and, and, and some of the low dose anti inflammatories, they, they, they can help a sense of well being and improve sleep, but directly they have very little role to play in terms of myofascial pain management. Um, I've always titrate medication against response, and that's, that's pretty much what I do. You know, every patient, I assess them as an individual and try and tailor a treatment plan that will work best for them. The other thing I quite like to establish is whether interventions have been useful or not so that we can, we can use those in the future. And so, you know, we set about having a management plan, which invariably always includes some sort of manual therapy, physiotherapy, exercise, mobility. Um, and of course, things like dry needling as incredibly helpful at releasing the, the muscle spasm as Simon well knows, um, manual therapy, injectables, and by injectables, I, I actually am encouraged by the early use of, of simple ultrasound guided injections to the myofascia of local anesthetic and steroid, which I feel work very well initially in, in certainly early presentations. I think later on, when, when muscle spasm becomes more established and you get movement disorders, then perhaps you, you know, a more academic discussion about Botox is potentially helpful. Um, maintaining function, of course, goes without saying. It's, it's absolutely critical that we don't simply stop doing what we do, develop fear avoidant behavior, and, 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 and then we have to work on the behavioral aspect. If there are psychosocial issues, again, they, they may not share this with you, but you know, if, you, if you ask the right questions, you might find that there are additional stresses that could, could help. That's my time has just gone off. Um, and I, at the bottom, I go, keep, keep moving, really. Proprioceptive remodeling is absolutely essential. And in part, it's, it's because if we're overwriting a dysfunctional pain pathway or dysfunctional cerebral map with decent information, we stand half the chance of getting the patient on the road to recovery. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean, for that really interesting uh, discussion. I mean, it, it's, you know, highlighting the fact that, you know, pain is such a multifactorial um, thing that we deal with. And so your approach is, you know, spot on with that in terms of its multimodal approach. And I think it sort of highlights how, you know, when we have an injury, there's so many different competing components that, that might contribute to that pain and being able to target different, different areas selectively is really, really critical. But um, yeah, that was brilliant. Thank you, uh, Dean. Next up, we've got Lorenzo, who's, uh, I believe Lorenzo, um, next up, who is going to chat through tennis elbow and or lateral epicondylopathy, lateral epicondylitis, or however, you, whatever you want to pronounce it as. And it's you know something that we see very commonly. So I'm sure he'll give you the lowdown and be able to um, inform us and educate us on best practice management. Can you see that or not? No. No. So I'm, I'm having problems sharing it for some reason. Uh, what about that? Uh, it's there. There we but, go. Yep. Okay. All good? Perfect, yep. Okay, fantastic, great, sorry. I wasn't sure whether this happened to me before where um, it, you know, I wasn't playing. Um, so I, I'm a sports exercise medicine consultant. I have interest in, in tendon pathology and uh, I thought I'd talk about tennis elbow because it's very, very common. And in fact, um, you know, it can be quite, com quite complicated. Uh, you know, Dean was talking about chronic pain and in fact, we often can see some patients with cr chronic pain um, uh, presenting as a, a, a complex tennis elbow. Um, so I have an interest in tendons. So tendons, obviously, um, they're very specialised structures. So tightly packed collagen fibres um, within these bundles, which then form a tendon. Interestingly, I was doing a webinar the other day on lower limb tendinopathy, and actually there's quite a lot of differences between upper limb and lower limb tendinopathy. Lower limb being springy type um, function, whereas upper limb is more positional 
uh, type function. So that, that might be a reason why they present slightly differently. So what, what happens is the, um, as a result of overload, you get these tightly packed collagen fibers then becoming like this, which is disarray. And um, certainly on the, in the um, lateral, lateral epicondyle, you've got the, the tennis elbow, which is here on the lateral epicondyle, becoming the, the forearm muscles. And we tend to see it, uh, you know, obviously in sporting athletes like tennis players, interestingly, we tend to see it more in amateur athletes. And then people that do repetitive um, activities, um, such as construction workers or laborers. Interestingly, over the last five or 10 years, we've also seen this, which is actually, in fact, metabolic factors such as obesity, um, lack of exercise, hypercholesterolemia, uh, impaired glucose tolerance, which also leads to increased pain levels in patients that have uh, this type of, or that have tendinopathy, which sort of mirrors what we see in osteoarthritis and many other chronic conditions. So, how does a person with tendinitis elbow present? Well, generally they complain of pain in the lateral aspect of the elbow, uh, and it tends to be associated with activity. So repetitive activity, or it could be sporting activity. And, and generally it's this test here that I tend to use um, to um, try and define uh, the tennis elbow. But in fact, not all elbow pain or lateral elbow pain is tennis elbow. And, and certainly it's my job to try and sort out some of the causes um, that might not be related to tennis elbow. For example, patients might have elbow joint pathology, elbow joint osteoarthritis. Uh, they may have nerve entrapments. There's certainly, um, you know, a association between referred pain from the cervical spine and tennis elbow. And also you see um, on occasion, particularly in younger patients, insertional biceps tendinopathy. So that presents more on the, uh, on the anterolateral aspects of the elbow rather than purely on the lateral aspect. And it tends to be the younger, the younger patient who, uh, who likes the gym. Um, so what I tend to do is use a clinical examination and, and certainly all of the SEM consultants that I work at at Robin Welbeck, we tend to use point of care ultrasound uh, to define whether patients have this pathology. So do you need ultrasound for all the patients that present with tennis elbow? No. I tend to use it uh, because a lot of patients present to me with unresolving tennis elbow. And so I, I use it as a way of confirming my clinical assessment or clinical examination. So here you see pictures of, of a tennis elbow, thickening of the tendon, uh, increased blood flow. This is a little under-surface partial tear. What you can see on, on ultrasound as well, you can see the radiocapitella joint, you can see whether they've got an effusion, you can have a look at the, um, uh, the nerves in the, in the elbow, particularly the radial nerve, to see if there's any evidence of entrapment. So it can give you clues as to whether uh, there's something else is going on uh, in, in the elbow. And, may, and that might lead on to uh, other investigations such as the MRI scan. So how do you manage tennis elbow? Well, I think my job uh, as a consultant in sports and exercise medicine is really to help the physiotherapists. I mean, they're, they're really the power horses of the musculoskeletal world, uh, and they get most of our patients better. But it's really education, confirmation of diagnosis, and really helping the physiotherapists uh, get their patients better. Um, I might look at you know, predisposing factors. So for example, in tennis players, you might look at um, you know, bracket factors such as tension, uh, uh, string tension or, or grip size. Um, you might look at you know, weaknesses in the kinetic chain. They might be weak in the shoulder or weak, weak in the back. But certainly with tennis elbow, no one treatment works for everyone. And, and, I, and it's my job to give patients options. Um, other options. So, you know, this is, um, you know, some really good physiotherapy that uh, patients can do. Um, you know, I, I, interestingly, there's some evidence now with uh, upper limb tendinopathy that higher frequency, lower weight is probably better than, say, for example, in lower limb tendinopathy, where you're looking at, um, you know, quite heavy, uh, less frequent loading. Uh, whereas for, for upper limb, shoulder and, and elbow and, in, and even the hand and wrist, higher frequency, um, lower load um, tends to be uh, more effective. Uh, so I tell patients, you know, if they're, say, for example, watching TV or they're doing something innocuous to actually get their exercise bands out, to get their weights out and, and do some exercise. 
So what are the other options for tennis elbow? Well, there's obviously a jump. So I tend to use this, which is an elbow brace. I think shockwave is reasonable. A lot of physiotherapists are doing shockwave. We're doing some phys uh, shockwave as well. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that um, you know, a particular type of shockwave is more effective, but certainly uh, there's radial and focus shockwave. And then there's this, which is actually GTN patch. Uh, so recent evidence suggests that uh, GTN patches are quite effective for uh, tendinopathy. So I tend to use these for both upper and lower limb tendinopathies. Uh, this is a little study, a systematic review that showed that it was quite effective. Um, so what, what patients do is they apply this directly on the skin overlying the uh, tendon and they leave it on for about 12 hours. Um, there are you know, certain side effects that you need to be aware of uh, and uh, some medical screening that you need to do for the patches. So injections are always a controversial area in tendinopathy and certainly in tennis elbow. This is a uh, narrative review that I helped uh, co-author a few years ago on the use of ultrasound guided injections for tendinopathy. And in summary, we look primarily at cortisone, but in summary for tendons and cortisone, what there seems to be is good short-term positive effect, but some question marks about medium to long-term effects. And this is particularly in tennis elbow. So this is an example of an injection we did for tennis elbow. So a systematic review in 2002 found that cortisone was very effective in the short term for tennis elbow. But subsequent to that, um, so between 2002 and 2016, there have been seven randomized controlled trials on cortisone and tennis elbow, and they've all shown, us, shown the same thing. Short term positive effects, but at three to six months, they actually, you do worse than if you uh, do nothing at all. So in fact, it causes medium term harm if you do a cortisone injection. So quite controversial. So some, <clears throat> as a result of these, uh, of these studies, some practitioners say that, you know, if you don't like someone, you give them a cortisone shot for tennis elbow, because the chances are that at three to six months, they'll do worse than actually do nothing at all. Now, of course, there's exceptions to that rule. I, I would use a cortisone on occasion if someone was, say, doing an exam or, uh, you know, they're they competing in some sort of event and they're aware of this uh, you know, potential for medium-term harm. But certainly we need to, to move away from, from cortisone, I think, for tennis elbow. What are the alternatives to cortisone? So this is called percutaneous tenosomy, and this is done under ultrasound. Uh, and uh, this can be quite effective uh, in the medium term. And we've also got PRP, which is plasma-rich plasma. So this is certainly um, very common uh, in musculoskeletal the world. But if you look at the evidence for PRP, uh, it's uh, particularly tenuous for tendons, and certainly I don't support uh, the use of PRP for uh, something like tennis elbow. Uh, so this is an example of, uh, I did an online course on ultrasound guided injections uh, um, for uh, tendons and joints. This is done by Sun uh, Skills. This is an example of an injection. So a transducer, this is a transducer here. This is a needle. Uh, needle going into the tendon, you can see coming from the right side. So you see the needle coming in here and targeting the area uh, of the tendon. So that's an ultrasound guided injection that you do. Um, so it's, it's important that you try and avoid the, the, the joint and the, um, and the ligament. So in summary, that was a really quick, quick uh, uh, tour of, of tennis elbow. There are no quick fixes. You need to look at the whole picture. Physiotherapy really is quite effective. You need to be cautious of the junks. Uh, certainly I tend to use non-invasive junks, GTM patches or shockwave therapy. And I think generally speaking, we should avoid cortisone injections. Maybe consider other injections uh, if uh, other treatments fail. So if anyone's interested in those studies, uh, if you look at my website, I've got a section on published research. Uh, and there's a whole list of, of papers, including that paper on the use of ultrasound guided injections in tendinopathy. Thank you. Thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Lorenzo. That's really interesting. And, you know, you sort of alluded to the fact there that you've got to consider tennis elbow as a whole in terms of shoulder girdle. 
you know, pelvic stability. And, and that's, I suppose, where, where we try to come in and, and look at, look at everything um, that's contributing to that sort of overload on the, on the elbow. But yeah, very, very interesting. Um, next up, we have Mr. Simon Owen Johnson, who's going to bring together all the, um, all the bits about COVID that have been affecting how we all practice and what he's seeing and some stats and all the recommendations and guidelines. But just a reminder, guys, if you've got any questions, um, hit, put them in the Q&A box and we will get them uh, covered at the end. So I'll hand this over to Simon. Great. Thank you, Simon. That's me unmuted. And thank you to Lorenzo and Dean for great talks. Um, I'm very pleased particularly to see that surgery was not mentioned as one of the options for treating tennis elbow because it is one of my bet noirs. You get these things sent and they come wanting an operation. And we all know, you in the audience and the, my colleagues here know that surgery is rarely the thing to do for tennis elbow. So um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit left field about coronavirus and the upper limb because clearly it's changed everything. Uh, and I'll draw your attention to my new phone number and email at the bottom there. So, oops. So, what we're going to cover. The guidance from the Royal Colleges and the Specialist Societies, I'm afraid, was aimed at GPs. Uh, and as we will see, uh, the Specialist Societies and the Royal Colleges have said to GPs, okay, well, physios are going to sort all this out, so don't bother the GPs now send everything to physios. And I don't know if they warned you about all of this or not, but you were certainly, um, the laser spot stopped on the physio's foreheads on the 23rd of March, basically. So we'll talk about that. Um, I'll summarize some of that. Then we'll talk a little bit about the risks of surgery with coronavirus around, some issues about consent. Um, we'll pick up on steroid injections because Back in March and April, steroid injections were completely out of fashion and very, very dangerous and were going to kill patients by making them more prone to coronavirus. Uh, and the spoiler alert is it doesn't, it's not true. Steroid is fine. Um, and then we'll look just briefly at my own practice on the last side about what has happened to it. Um, just me and the tumbleweed, really. So, British Orthopaedic Association, our august leaders, and they produced a document in June which said they were very aware that there was a growing burden of untreated orthopaedic bone and joint pathology on waiting lists that wasn't getting anywhere. And those patients couldn't get to their GPs for guidance, they couldn't get to the hospitals for guidance, not least because the consultant secretaries were no longer consultant secretaries, they were doing something else and the consultants were doing something else. Um, because I don't work for the NHS, I wasn't involved in all of that stuff. But I know that some of my colleagues, uh, plastic surgeons, to me, uh, a while back, was involved in prone turning patients on ITU. So everyone has been redeployed to some extent. So the BOA was aware of the problem. Um, and they produced this rather grim document, if I got a mouse here, which shows here that there were a large number of people. So 18 weeks is the NHS target. Um, I can't tell from the participants list how many of you still work for the NHS. Uh, clearly I recognize some of the uh, private physio names. But the number of patients who were waiting for orthopedic surgery had doubled over uh, the course of essentially the start of the coronavirus epidemic. So then the College of Surgeons weighed in um, and the most recent thing, they published things on a Friday afternoon for reasons best known to themselves and their most recent guidance um, said that NHS England has announced that it will end the contract. So I don't know if all the physios are aware but the NHS in London, I can only speak for London because I live here, but it commandeered all the private facilities back in March and it said you cannot do private operating, we need your capacity to do our uh, NHS work because the NHS hospitals will be doing coronavirus patients and be ventilating them. So we in the private surgical world haven't been doing any private operating since March, apart from uh, emergency work. So anyway, last Friday, it was announced officially that that was going to come to an end and the blanket commandeering is stopping, but, and it's an important but, there will be 
local agreements with the private sector on a needs basis. Now, I don't know what the need is in central London, and I don't know what the various hospitals are planning because they keep those cards close to their chest, but there may not be a great unshackling of private healthcare capacity coming, unfortunately. Um, so here we go, block contracts have gone and more misery about the number of patients who have been waiting for surgery. And this is just the patients we know about. And you'll have seen from the news that there's a whole load of patients who haven't been able to get into the healthcare system either. So there's a whole load of patients we don't even know about yet who are still to work their way through. Because we imagine that most of the demand for healthcare hasn't actually vaporized and gone away. We're just not seeing it. And here we go, Neil Mortensen, who's only just become the president of the College of Surgeons, great timing, um, said COVID's taken a wrecking ball to all those legally binding targets for 18 weeks. So I haven't yet seen any, um, any work on what's going to happen about the law, but the trusts are currently breaking their own laws. Um, and I don't know quite how they're going to work that one out. But clearly it's not by operating their way out of trouble. And here's another thing to emphasise here that a quarter, this was a survey from May, a quarter of NHS surgeons of all flavours had been using private facilities through these block contracts to help them get through the urgent work. So we'll come on to what guidance is available. So this is the Elbow and Shoulder Society. Now you know this is a, it's a hybrid organisation. There are surgeons there and physios there and AHPs, they're, they're classified as. And so this guidance has been drawn up by surgeons and Joe Gibson, effectively. Um, and so the Elbow and Shoulder Society have a whole load of good stuff for GPs. Let's go to the next one about it, um, which goes through the gamut of shoulder conditions and some starting treatments for them. So your patients, when you get them, if they've come to the NHS, are likely at the moment, I think, to have been given some guidance and had some slightly, the pathways have changed. Um, people are coming having had a lot more telephone triage. A lot more people have had, at the moment, uh, video physio with an AXA or Nuffield person who may be miles and miles and miles away. Uh, and some of the patients are getting medical care from an equally long distance away. So I've been contacted by AXA to treat someone in Dundee with a frozen shoulder, which is quite challenging. It's amazing what you can do, but there's a lot of information around there. So the Elbow and Shoulder Society have got some stuff out there and then they've got videos and guidance and stuff. Now, you, I know you've got your own sources, but I really just wanted to point this out so that you're aware what the GPs are likely to be telling their patients. And there's some guidance as well, which is all downloadable, actually quite a good resource. The Hand Society is doing something very, very similar. So they have this rather nice diagram which tells GPs and patients what to do with different categories of injury. Hands is one of those things that GPs don't really get. It's a hand, oh my goodness, a hand, you better go to emergency care. Well, emergency care is not available. And a lot of hand things don't need to go to a and &E. A lot of hand things can be treated locally, but clearly some of them do. So there are some things at the bottom here. So this is a triage thing. In addition to that, uh, they declared that non-emergency hand care was not going to be taking place full stop during the COVID epidemic, and that has yet to be reversed. They've also got this thing, which is the Hand Injury Triage app, which is a, a web-based walkthrough so you eventually effectively answer yes or no at each of these stages and then you can work your way through to a reasonable first aid treatment. Um, so that is also available. These links are all on the last slide. Um, so here's an example. What do you do with a human bite? So human bites are, we all know, human bites are what comes from fighting and fighting what comes from being locked in with alcohol. So bites are on the up evidently. So it gives you a starting point. Right, steroids. So the guidance on steroids has come from all of these bodies. So the pain medicine faculties in there, the imaging people are in there, uh, rheumatology, sports docs, sorry, not in there. 
um, but I imagine will have been consulted at some point. And this is the current guidance for the use of steroids in the coronavirus epidemic. So don't start them unless you need to. Use the lowest dose. Don't stop them if patients are on them. And if you need to inject, it is reasonable. So there are some issues. I might just come back to those. This is from the Hand Society. Um, so they discovered looking at the patients who had steroids over the past four months, no burden of coronavirus uh, exacerbation or prevalence. So despite all the concerns in March, steroid injections do not worsen coronavirus, do not make a patient more likely to get it, do not worsen it more likely to die or anything else like that. If I just go back one slide, the only other thing to bear in mind is that for those patients, for GPs really, who are starting oral prednisolone, it might put them into a shielding category, but an injection will not. So for my colleagues, all of whom inject to a greater or lesser extent, we're all safe to carry on. Right, consent is an important issue. And this has come from the college. Again, it's downloadable. The reason consent matters is because we're having to consider more and more the non-operative treatment uh, options because surgery is dangerous during a coronavirus epidemic. Now, I read this document and this is kind of, I think for all of us on the panel, this is our sort of mantra anyway. Let's think about non-operative care. Let's think about not treating. Does it need to be treated? Can it be treated in various other ways? Um, what are the options? for success, failure, alternative treatments, are the adjunct things there? So four months ago, there were hardly any physios available. So even if I'd done a shoulder operation, no rehab, duff outcome. So all of this is, to my mind, normal. It matters because of this issue, Montgomery versus Lanarkshire, which is the document that guides us on consent, and it has changed the burden of power from for consenting changed it from what I think or what a surgeon thinks a patient should know to an absolute legal obligation on me to explain to a patient what the patient would want to know about any given treatment. And bearing in mind that if I was to admit a patient to a hospital, I cannot guarantee that they won't catch COVID and I certainly can't guarantee they won't die of COVID then my consent process to anyone who's able to sign the form has to involve the possibility of them dying of coronavirus in hospital. So consent has become a big thing for us. Um, now, unfortunately on my screen, I suspect that the gallery is in the way of this critical bit of information here. So the chance of catching coronavirus and this is from the States, but it's the same in the UK, is about half a percent within hospital. But that's still one in 200. And it's the same as other hospital acquired infections. So it's not enormous, but it's not small. But equally, oops, my thing gone. the difficulty is that if you do have coronavirus and you have an operation, you have a roughly one in four chance of dying. So coronavirus changes everything if you have it and you're having surgery. So it is still a very, very important thing. And we're seeing, and we're all aware that the, the lockdown thing is easing off. And I've seen on the, the news this evening that the numbers are coming up again in Germany and France and Australia and Antigua and all sorts of things are happening. So it's far from gone away yet. So my last slide, but one or two, is just to look at what I've been doing over the past five months. So the first thing in the middle here is misery. So in the five month period from March onwards last year, I saw about 300 new patients. And over the same period this year, I've seen just under 90. And I looked last night at what those 90 were, and far and away the biggest group with the frozen shoulders. 
which kind of makes sense because that's the condition you know is agony. It's a condition that robs you of sleep. So it makes perfect sense that they are still there. I think they're the same numbers pretty much as before. That's roughly a 15 week period. And I see roughly one a week, I think roughly. But interestingly, chronic shoulder pain, long term things are still in there somewhere. Calcific tendonitis has cropped up. Again, it's agony. Carpal tunnel wakes people up. Uh, but a smattering of minor bits and pieces. And then the ones in gold here, I just pick out. These are the lumps and bumps. These are things where something has changed shape. So I saw a guy yesterday with a rupture of the short head of biceps from the Lacertus fibrosis at the elbow. It's the maddest thing ever. I've never seen it before. I'll never see it again. Um, he came from a physio to ultrasound him and the physio had never seen it either. So it was very much a reassurance thing. So even though we've got the hospitals are scary places full of COVID, still the weird and wonderful is coming through. And I think that is it. I'll just put the last one up as those websites if anyone wants to screenshot that. But that is me done. Rupal, over to you. So Simon's going to just go through the last few questions that we've got in the Q&A. Yep. Uh, thank you, Simon. OJ, that was, um, yeah, very interesting and very ent entertaining and, you know, just showed all the issues that you and your surgical colleagues and, you know, all of us are facing from, you know, in the way that we're having to treat people because it has changed what we have to do. Um, but I, we've had a few questions coming in and um, some of them with Lorenzo's answered about sort of GTN patches and tendinopathy and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's been a bigger question put to the panel about PRP injections and perhaps their efficacy. And did you guys want to take on this one? Dean, did you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I can talk briefly about PRP. I know Lorenzo and I, we've, we've, we've shared thoughts on PRP uh, over the last year or so, uh, as we both sort of got independent interests in it. Um, I spent a good period of last year immersed in, 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 in sort of reading a, a great deal of literature uh, and, and spent quite a bit of time training um, with, with uh, an, an outfit in Germany. Um, I think having having certainly gone into it fairly enthusiastically, I've 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 somewhat put things into context in as much as Lorenzo was absolutely right. The 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 evidence is 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 scant. Uh, the studies are not brilliant. Um, it, there is more evidence coming out. The the only thing I will say is is for early OA, particularly early OA in the knee. Uh, there is reasonable evidence that that PRP interventions are helpful. Um, they're not helpful at reversing what's going on, but they they do buy time, and 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 for many patients that's that's enough. And certainly, when one would, if if one's to consider in that context, PRP versus steroid, I think you're right. Steroid will will buy you the short term gain, but but medium to long term is probably not the answer. And I think we all we all have to be honest with ourselves in as much as how much steroid are we using and, and, and should we be using it as we have currently done. So I, I've used quite a bit of PRP. Um, I have used it in various tendinopathies. Uh, I'd say I'd get a 50-50 response from them. Um, the, the downside of course is that PRP is not covered by insurers or, or, or some insurers claim to cover it, but they don't actually cover the full amount. So, so it's, it's, it's not easiest to access at the moment. Um, the outcomes are not brilliant, but those, those patients whom I've seen respond have been very happy with their treatment. So I think we need to consider it at all times. Thanks, Dean. No problem. Um, Lorenzo, did you want to add anything? Or, yeah, no, I think, that covered I, it all. I think, cool. I, I think I agree, I agree with uh, what the team was saying. I, I think there's, so if you look at the studies, I think there's very little evidence to suggest that PRP is better than say something like dry needling uh, for tendinopathy. So 
uh, for me personally, I, I, I certainly wouldn't use it as a second or third line. It would be only if someone was requesting it and they'd failed other treatment. So as a general rule, um, I think the evidence is, is scanned for PRP. And I, I certainly wouldn't use it for a, a large weight bearing tendon like Achilles and patellar tendon. Although having said that, there, you know, some of my colleagues in Spain have done some interesting studies on PRP in um, in the and got some reasonable results. But I, I'm sitting on the fence, certainly. Okay, cool. Thanks, Lorenzo. Um, did you? There's been. I'm interested that GTN patches. Have, well, we. We're using them for a while out of Australia, probably 15, 10, 10, maybe 10, 12 years ago. Interesting to hear that there's a bit more good research out there about their sort of response. Interesting. A colleague of mine in Australia did the first randomized controlled trial, I think it was in 2003 or 2004. Uh, and I, I was, I sort of stopped using them, but actually in the last five years, we've seen increasing evidence of, uh, of their effectiveness. Now the question is whether it is actually the nitric oxide that's actually doing the, 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 the good work or whether there's a significant placebo component as well. I mean it's great actually getting people on board I think for it because it reminds them they have a problem and they're more likely then to comply with, with exercise which I think yeah. is what will get people better. Yeah. Um, okay interesting. Um, and one, a few more sort of questions popping up about sort of steroid injections and also um, the, the reasoning behind the reduced steroid use with COVID patients. Um, Simon, did you want to take this one on? Um, just what is the consideration or reasoning behind sort of reduced steroid use in COVID patients? Yeah, well, it came about, there's something to do with the first um, coronavirus thing which I think was Japan about 15 years ago and there was a cohort of patients who'd had steroid injections then and they did worse in some way shape or form and I haven't looked up the original data I know but and it was believed therefore that the new coronavirus thing would act in the same way and that steroids would be dangerous and so it was a little bit like ibuprofen was suddenly on the banned list steroids were on the banned list as well uh, and then uh, who was I talking to? One of my, one of the radiologists, I think, from another sports clinic in the area, and he was saying, "No, we're still doing them, but we're having a, a it's a it's a Montgomery compliant um, patient specific consent process, saying there's a possibility we don't know that it'll make it worse, but if your frozen shoulder, as it typically was, is so bad that you can't sleep, then you know we can inform you it's the risk that you have to take." And then that happened all around the country. And then ultimately, David Warwick and the guys from the Hand Society wrote and said, we've looked at all these and there's no burden. It's not true. It just didn't happen. So it was a kind of a, a sort of a meme, a thing that was that didn't really ever take place. OK, perfect. Thanks, Simon. Um, also, there's another question being put to, to you guys on um, do we need extra consent? And this might be one you wanted to take on any of you guys for steroid injections um, with or it, sorry I'll, I'll read the question do we need extra consent for steroid injections or is the risk of being vulnerable to COVID-19 negligible I'll take it again if you like the, the evidence is that the risk is negligible and our large uh, hospital corporation of America group nearby have a special consent form that specifically mentions it so the answer is yes to both uh, it's no risk and there is a special consent form. I don't, I personally don't think you would be doing anything outrageous if you didn't have a special consent form, but current custom and practice seems to be that there is a specific discussion of the risks. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Thanks, Simon. That is across the board. Everyone, you know, if every COVID patient there is, there's a, a number of, you know, pre, pre, pre-visit pre questionnaires and again the consent is now a two two-part consent but i completely agree with simon um I, I i've never really felt that the the corticosteroid risk was 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 measurable or, or something that would amount to anything uh, simply because you know injected long-acting steroid in small parts have very little systemic effect the sixty-four thousand dollar question is whether steroids actually a good thing if you have a coronavirus uh, issue so the dexamethasone thing seems to be good for lungs 
and some of the anti-inflammatories, some of the, sorry, some of the rheumatoid disease-modifying drugs have been trialed for COVID because they prevent that autoimmune pneumonitis, which is the thing that kills you. You don't, as far as I, I mean, I'm a bone surgeon. What do I know about this stuff? Nothing. I'm a carpenter. <laughs> but it would seem that you don't die of corona virus you die of your own body's response to it it's a SARS thing isn't it it's a SARS yeah it is and so you know the the rheumatoid drugs may moderate that and modulate that and steroid may do something similar too so it may actually turn out to be a good thing yeah interest interesting stuff definitely there's also just another comment on uh i think simon you mentioned it about you know a lack of physiotherapy generally and i think a lot of us have done loads of these video consults over 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 the period you know i've spent five months doing these video consults and doing hundreds of them but finding generally how effective they can be at helping mm -hmm. you know reduce pain give educate people give them good advice show them an exercise program demonstrate take them through it offer some support to them you know and and sometimes guide them out of pain sometimes okay they need further input down the line tissue work or to see other people but um have you guys had sort of similar feedback, hopefully? Come on, you two guys. Oh, they've gone quite, they've gone quite. It, I have, yeah. yeah. I'm just, I'm just looking, looking at um, Sabina Marks here as well, saying she's been doing video stuff. And I think, yeah, yeah. yeah, generally speaking, people have been actually very pleased with video physio. I, it's like everything, it's like video consultation. It's got its limits. But it's not hopeless by any stretch of the imagination. And it's clearly way, way better than no physio. So I think, generally speaking, people have been very pleased with it. I mean, I, when I look at the physio literature, from time to time, there's a paper crops up which talks about the benefit of group physio over one-to-one -one physio. And it always says that group physio comes out slightly better from an NHS thing, you know, you have a shoulder class or a knee class, like was sort of 1950s. And it always amuses me that, you know, we've evolved physio to a point where it is bespoke and one-to-one. -one. And in some respects, the old joint-based classes have still something to offer. And so even if you can't do your one-to-one -one hands-on, you can't do your manual and you're having to go via a, a video examination, that still can be effective. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah. Um... I think there's another question Tamara was asking, has there been any anecdotal or reasonable evidence for acupuncture as a modality used for myofascial pain? Now I can probably help with this as well. If you guys um, are happy for me to respond. Hi, um, Simon. I think, uh, you know, dry needling, acupuncture, whatever you wanted to call it, I think can be particularly effective in myofascial pain. I think um, depending on whether there's a degree of central sensitization, you need to watch out for that because sometimes people can respond in a, quite an alarming way. But I think um, you can get very, very good responses. And this is anecdotally and there's, there's some reasonable evidence out there, um, not that I've got to hand, but that it can be effective and can change people's pain quite immediately. Um, so, yeah, I think um, often, you know, it can be a nice adjunct and, and if someone's responding well to needling, we know then that that might respond a little bit better sometimes to trigger point injections or may then be a good candidate for some Botox injections down the line if you're not quite solving it, but you're helping them for short periods of time. That's certainly an impression um, that, that we've found in our clinics. Dean, does that support what you I, see? I, I completely support that 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 view. Um, I, I was just 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 thinking about the draft guidelines that, of course, NICE are producing, aren't they? Um, which uh, was 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 fairly topical a week or so ago, talking about what we can and can't prescribe in terms of of ongoing pain medication. And you know, one of the things that keeps coming up is that dry needling, exercise, psychological support always remain within that, 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 that group of treatments and that never changes. So, you know, yes, there is plenty of evidence that it works. And, you know, we're now being told by, by, by NICE that, that these, these should be considered above uh, conventional analgesics and other medication that we're currently using. So getting back to tomorrow, 
incredibly useful and, and does provide us with a lot of information as to how patients might respond to further treatment. Excellent, okay, thanks Dean. This might be just a quick one on what's the strategy for elective orthopedic surgeries whilst in this pandemic? Simon, do you have a, a quick 30 second response <laughs> on that one? Um, well, at first, there was a, there's a categorization of severity of cases and most elective orthopedics was category three or category four, i.e. things that can wait three, or mu three months or more because uh, emergency general surgery, ruptured aneurysm and so on and so forth and cancer surgery was going to take precedence. And now that the, the requirement for NHS care has diminished, the cap fours are becoming fair game again. The difficulty is that all the hospitals currently require a quarantine period. So Welbeck's got a seven day quarantine period, the others are on 14 days. And so it's an enormous ask of a patient to keep the whole household indoors for two weeks so that somebody can have an operation. So I, I've got about 20 people who are still waiting and I phoned them all uh, a few weeks ago and I got three takers, three said, yeah, I'll have that. And the other 17 said, yeah, I'll give you a ring at Christmas kind of thing. So there's not that much demand for uh, the, if you like, the price of surgery is too high. The strategy for reintroducing from an NHS point of view, I don't know because I don't work for the NASH, but clearly there's a huge bulge of patients, some of whom will have deteriorated quite significantly over the period of time and will no longer be the people that can wait X weeks. They're going to have to get done sooner rather than later. And with the same capacity, if you have a thing that could wait, you're going to have to wait even longer. So. I think it's a very difficult time. I was talking to Ed at Welbeck earlier on today and he's heard talk that there may be four years worth of contracts going ahead to try and use some of the NHS to, to, to outsource some of the NHS to the private sector because the NHS doesn't have the capacity. Um, I mean, you can argue all day about whether it's a political lack of investment, but there isn't, there's not the brick and mortar there to do it. Wow, four years. Hmm. Interesting. Well, we might... Um wrap it up on that note um but look i wanted to say thanks to uh lorenzo dean and simon for their really fascinating insight and and the discussions that we've just had i really enjoyed it got a lot out of it and um i hope you guys did too so thanks again um from one world back thank, thank you very much thank, thank you. you thanks simon thank you simon bye thank you